Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host. We hope you're having a wonderful Advent. I'm joined here by the great Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, always delightful to talk with you. Brandon, always a joy to be with you. Listen, before I forget, I want to mention this at the beginning and not just at the end, that as we get closer to the end of the year 2018, we're moving into 2019. If you're listening to this show and you've enjoyed the Word on Fire show for some time, we're asking for your help. We would love it if you would join us on this mission. We produce hundreds and hundreds of free resources, including this podcast, Bishop Barron's Daily Reflections, our websites, our articles, all that kind of stuff. But the fact is, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes resources, but it takes money. It just takes money to produce these things. We have to pay for the equipment, the hosting, the manpower, the operations, all that. So we can't do it without the help of our listeners and supporters. And so if you value the work of Word on Fire, if you like the work we're doing to evangelize the culture, please help us out. Go to wordonfireshow.com slash giving and help us continue this great mission into the new year. Well, Bishop, uh, we're smack in the middle of the Advent season here. We did a whole episode last week on the theme of Advent. Yeah. Um, any, any more thoughts on Advent as we move near to the Christmas season? Well, this, what a spiritually rich season it is and how it is uh, echoed throughout the entire year. All of Christian life is a kind of Advent season. Adventus, the Lord, come, Lord. Think of the very last words of the whole Bible, right? Go to the end of the book of Revelation. You know, come, Lord Jesus, come. Um, that's the attitude of the church now throughout the ages. That's an Advent attitude. You know, we talked in the last episode about some of the key Advent figures, including Isaiah, but one of them is Mary, the mother of God, maybe the preeminent Advent figure, because she's yep. sort of waiting for the birth of of her Lord and God, just as, as we are. And I realized when I went through the archives of the Word on Fire show that we'd never done an episode after 150 episodes. We'd never done one on Mary. And so I thought... Is that right? Yeah, so yeah. Specifically on Mary. Huh? That's right. Yeah, we've talked... Well, that's an oversight, so we'll try to correct that. Yeah, <laughs> please. Good. We'll ask the mother of God to forgive us. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's... I, I want to go over some basics and then get into some deeper stuff, but maybe we'll start off with this. Uh, we talk a lot about the nuns, the spiritually and religiously unaffiliated. Suppose a nun came up to you, wasn't biblically literate, wasn't... Didn't have a religious background, didn't really know much about Mary, uh, and they said... Tell me about Mary. What should I know? What are the basics that you would explain? Well, with, with someone like that, so an unaffiliated person who doesn't uh, have a sense of, of the biblical background and all that, I probably begin with the idea of, of the fiat, you know, the Latin for let it be, let it be done. Um, Mary's great word to the angel in Latin, uh, in the Latin version, when the angel invites her, right, to be the mother of God. And she signals her her puzzlement over this. I mean, how can this be? But then when the angel lays the, the truth of it out, Mary says, let it be done to me according to uh, thy word. Well, there's, there's the beginning of it in a way. The spiritual life begins and ends with this fiat. Our culture is very much predicated upon the, you know, I, I do it. I decide. Uh, I'll determine the meaning of my life. Where Mary is in the attitude of acquiescence in the presence of a higher will and a higher voice. Hey, how often, Brandon, and I'm not bad-mouthing it necessarily, but how often in our culture this issue of my voice, that my voice be heard, that my voice get around the table, that my voice be respected. And again, in its proper framework, I, I don't quarrel with that. But that becomes in it such an exaggerated expression of what it's all about, that my voice rings out. Where Mary is saying, no, let it be done to me according to thy word. Your voice, O Lord, is more important than mine. Your will is more important than mine. Your action is something I acquiesce to in my life. Now, that's not passivity before an oppressor. That's an invitation to real spiritual life, right? So maybe with a nun, with, a, with an unaffiliated, with someone just starting from scratch, I might start with that. Mary's the one who reverses a lot of our expectations about what the good life is. The good life finally comes down to a great fiat, 
let it be done to me, a surrender to a higher power. And see, now you can link that right away to the Bible, because Mary, in many ways, sums up Israel. She's, as it were, Israel at its best. What has Israel been at its best? The people that listens to a higher voice. Abraham heard the voice of the Lord and followed it. Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is God alone. The prophets heard. They called the people to listen to a higher voice. So Mary, who listens and acquiesces, is Israel at its best. When we do that, what happens? God's grace can rush into the world, right? Think of the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David, the king. The Spirit of the Lord hovering over Mary, right? The Spirit of the Lord uh, uh, impregnating Mary. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, right? The, the birth of Christ in us I'm now pressing it. I'm, I'm going a few steps beyond maybe what a, a nun uh, would take in. But the acquiescence to the Spirit will lead to the birth of Christ in us, right? So maybe I'd start there, though. I'd start with fiat, with an unaffiliated. Let's stick with that moment when the angel comes to announce that Christ is going to be born in her. Because I know a lot of modern skeptics, they hone in on this particular episode in the Bible and they say, oh... Look at you Christians. You believe all this pre-scientific nonsense about a virgin becoming pregnant. That's so unscientific. How would you respond to that sort of criticism? You know, in a way, I'd say, um, so what? Who died and made science boss? You know what I'm saying? Is that we can, we can become so scientific in our approach that only what the sciences can take in and measure is the real. And I, I think that's just a, a, an act of hubris. It's not saying one negative thing at all about the sciences in their proper framework. But don't give me the view that now that's the that's coterminous with reality, what the sciences can take in. That God, who's the source of all being, who's who's at the ground of all the laws of science, could not for his purposes do something that is um, uh, that involves a kind of suspension of the laws of science, the laws of nature, rather. Uh, why is that ruled out of court automatically? That, that only what the sciences can take in and measure is the real. I think reality goes way beyond what the sciences can take in. Uh, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy, Horatio. We hear in Hamlet, we'll just substitute science for philosophy. Um, so in a way, I guess my reaction is, is well, you know, who, who made your worldview the only legitimate one? I, I can take in the whole of the sciences, but also say, might there be something greater, something more? An angel represents the, the breakthrough of a higher level of being. Can I uh, experiment on, a, on an angel, put an angel under a microscope? Can I see an angel with a telescope? Of course not. It's outside the realm of the empirically observable. But gosh, what a cramped little world we live in if that's all that we accept is real. Um, people all over the, the world and across cultures have witnessed to a higher dimension of being. Why is it ruled automatically out of court? You know, so I, I think um, awaken your sense of wonder a little bit. Awaken your sense of uh, intellectual adventure a little bit. Many apologists and evangelists have made this point that the miracle of Mary conceiving God within her depends on the scientific fact that normally people don't give birth to transcendent beings. So, like, we yeah. have to agree that this is scientifically abnormal in order for sure. to recognize it as a miracle. Yeah, I see you're right, Brandon, that one of the prejudices of our time is that all oh, these poor benighted people, you know, in the first century that didn't know any better and they believed all kinds of, you know, crazy things. No, but you, you, your point is, is a legitimate one. They put it in the Bible as this marvelous thing because they knew it was deeply strange. They knew it wasn't at all what people would expect. The same is true, by the way, of the resurrection. You, you'll hear that a lot from the skeptics. Like, Oh, these poor things, you know, these silly, uh, naive people that accepted resurrection from the dead. They didn't accept resurrection from the dead. They, they weren't expecting it at all, which is precisely why the texts of the New Testament are so rife with excitement and with the sheer strangeness of the message. It's because they knew dead people didn't come back to life. Of course they knew that. And therefore, 
that it happened in this extraordinary case was enough to turn the whole world upside down. And I think there's there's truth there, too, with the, uh, um, the virginal conception of Jesus. In the first few centuries of the church, there was crackling debate around who Jesus was. But alongside mm-hmm. that, there was a lot of raging debate about who Mary was. Can you talk to yeah. us about some of those discussions and what they concluded? Yeah, and here's the first point to make always. Think, think of Fulton Sheen here, that uh, Mary's like the moon. She's always reflected light. Uh, whatever light Mary has comes from Christ. Uh, shift the metaphor, Mary is always meant to draw our attention to Christ. So all the, the statements we make doctrinally about Mary are not first about her. They're really about Christ. They're, they're a way of saying something true about Jesus. Um, so that's the first you know, context. The central debate, Brandon, about Mary in the early days was in a way very Christological because it was about whether she ought to have this title Theotokos in Greek, which means God-bearer or mother of God. And there were, you know, smart and well-intentioned people that said, well, I love Mary, but that's going over the top to call her mother of God. Because, I mean, come on, God doesn't have a mother. God is the uncreated source of existence. To speak of, of God having a mother seems to make God a contingent being. It seems more mythological, you know, like, did Zeus have a mother? And so God has a mother. It just seemed odd, wouldn't it be better to say she's the she's the Christ bearer, the mother of the humanity of Jesus, right? And so we honor her, of course, and she's wonderful, but don't call her Theotokos. Well, the Council of Ephesus, the Church 431, famously says, no, she ought to be called Theotokos, the mother of God, not because she's the mother of Jesus in his divine nature. So that's true. They're honoring the fact that everything I just said is true, that, that God, the unconditioned source of being, doesn't have a, a cause exterior, exterior to himself. So that's true. She's not the mother of the divine nature of Jesus. But she's the mother of Jesus, who has two natures, divine and human. So Jesus can and should be called divine. Therefore, as the mother of Jesus, she's the mother of God. <laughs> and so it was following that very interesting logic of incarnational language that the church said, no, we'll call her mother of God quite correctly, even as we acknowledge the truth of what the opponents are saying. But given the structure of that uh, logic, she can and should be called mother of God. And then that beautiful detail that after the uh, declaration, there was this torchlit parade through the streets of Ephesus to celebrate uh, Mary, the mother of God. And we have ever since, haven't we? Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners. Uh, so that's a good example of a great debate about Mary, which was ultimately a debate about Jesus and how best to talk about Jesus. And it's correlative to the great council of Chalcedon, which followed 20 years later, 451, in which it was claimed that in Jesus' singular person, two natures, divine and human, come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. And so that's why Mary can and should be called, uh, Theotokos, mother of God. Oftentimes you'll find among our Protestant friends and family the assumption that any reverence or attention that we pay to Mary detracts from reverence and attention to Christ. There's there's this zero-sum struggle that we got to yeah. sort of choose one or the other, but the Catholic approach is, is a little different. Can you talk about why this isn't a zero-sum game between the two of them? Because God doesn't compete with his creatures. Uh, God is not one being on the same playing field, as it were. You know, think of all the creatures you can imagine, you and I and, and, uh, and this computer and this room and the planet Jupiter and every animal on Earth. And think all these creatures. And then, oh, and then God is, is one of the beings among all these beings. See, in that framework, God would indeed be a competitor, right? He'd be jockeying for position on the same... Uh, on, logical playing field. But that's precisely what God is not. God is not one being among many, but God is the unconditioned source of being itself. And so the upshot is that God doesn't jockey with uh, creatures for position. He's not in a rivalry with creatures. In fact, the closer God gets, the more creatures are themselves, the more alive and the more of themselves they are. 
The glory of God is a human being fully alive, right? Now, apply that to Mary, because Mary, sinless Mary, is a human being fully alive, right? She's God's masterpiece in a way. She's she's the queen of all the saints, because in her, the splendor of God can shine forth most fully, precisely in her humanity, in, in, the, in the beauty of humanity. And therefore, to your original point, we're not playing a zero-sum game. That if we give all this honor to Mary, I'm somehow denigrating God. No. God delights in the honor that we give to Mary. God wants us to honor Mary. I've always liked the comparison of, of an artist with his artwork, right? Uh, I'm an artist at a very low level, you know, but I do drawings and paintings and stuff. If someone compliments my uh, painting, well, heck, I'm complimented. Uh, thank you. You know, what a beautiful uh, drawing. Oh, thank you. You know, so in a way, when, when we compliment Mary, we, we honor her, we praise her. How is God insulted by that? God is delighted by that because Mary is his masterpiece. I want to spend some time going through some of the major dogmas or doctrines about Mary. And I know to head you off, you're going to say, oh, that's a brief answer to a really complicated question that could, we could do a whole course on each of these. So, yeah. uh, but maybe in just a few minutes for each one, let's talk through some of these because I think they're often confused and misunderstood. Let's start off with the Immaculate Conception. What is that referred to and why is it important? Yeah, very often, as you say, people confuse the Immaculate Conception with the virginal conception of Jesus. So the Immaculate Conception refers to Mary's conception uh, without original sin. So Mary's conceived immaculately, so without the macula, without the stain of sin. Um, go back to St. Irenaeus here, one of my great heroes, who used that typology of, of uh, the new Eve, the, the first Eve, right, who sins and through her sin introduces the, the stain of, of sin into the human race. Mary is the reversal or the undoing of Eve, which is why deliciously when, the, when it moved into the Latin world, the Ave of the angel to Mary, like Ave Maria, A-V-E, was seen as the reversal of Eva, E-V-A, right? So Mary reverses Eve. Eve is the mother of, of our sin, in a way. And so Mary, the new Eve, becomes the mother of our salvation. Mary is the original sinner, or rather, Eve is the original sinner. Mary is conceived without original sin. So it, it's meant as sort of a, a balance. It's a, it's a reverse typology. Mary is, is the new Eve, and therefore the mother of the church the mother of this new community of those who follow her son. I think that's the import of the Immaculate Conception. All right, let's look at Mary's perpetual virginity. Now, I remember when I converted from Protestantism, this one always made me scratch my head. I get that I get the importance of Mary being a virgin when Christ was born, but the Catholic Church holds that she remained a, a virgin the rest of her life. Why is that significant? Well, let me, how about I answer the first part and I'll let you uh, respond to the second part. I'd be eager to hear that. Uh, Mary's virginity, of course, is very important for uh, the truth of the incarnation. So if Mary conceived in, in the usual way, well, then we're not really dealing with the incarnation of the Son of God. But as the angel says to her, you know, the, the Holy Spirit will, will overshadow you, and the one born in you will be called the, the Son of the Most High. And so her virginity is a very important way of witnessing to the fact of the incarnation. Um, Tell me how you, I'm curious about that, how you, moving from the Protestant to the Catholic world, resolve the perpetual virginity yeah, I issue. Think if, if I remember correctly, I, I was reading a lot about typology, the way that mm -hmm. these Old Testament signs and symbols pointed forward to the New Testament. And a lot of the authors I was reading were connecting Mary to the Ark of the Old Covenant. Yeah. And they would suggest, you know, just as the Ark carried the manna and the staff and the Ten Commandments, but after it served its purpose, you wouldn't just use the Ark as a dinner table, or just as the chalice at yeah. Mass, after it had served its great liturgical purpose, you wouldn't just bring it to the back and, you know, pour some yeah. Coke in it and drink out of it. So there's something sacred about Mary as this vessel that contained God yeah. within her that had to remain perpetually pure. That's lovely. You know, and I love the, the, uh, uh, the image of the Ark. Uh, years ago, when I used to give tours at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, uh, on the facade is, is that typical medieval um, connection between Mary and the Ark. It goes back to the Church Fathers, too. 
um, because she's the definitive Ark of the Covenant, because she bears in her own body the presence of, of the Lord in the in the richest possible way. And um, that just keeps generating new meaning, I think. Uh, Mary, the Ark, the vessel, um, the, the sacred chalice in a way. You know, so I think that's, that's beautiful stuff. Well, let's turn to one more Marian dogma. And again, this is yeah. not one that just comes from tradition. This one was dogmatically declared by a pope, one of the highest forms of teaching in the Catholic Church, that Mary, at the, at the conclusion of her life, was assumed into heaven bodily. Talk about that. What does that mean and why is that important? Yeah, I think the first move is, is don't, I mean, the, the artist will depict it in a very kind of physicalistic way of the body of Mary, you know, as, ascending sort of physically up into the sky. Uh, that's a symbolic way of gesturing toward the truth here, but the truth is very profound. See, we, we're still haunted by Platonism in many ways, aren't we? That salvation is often a question of, of escaping from the body. We finally get out of this miserable body and we go up to a spiritual realm. And there's still, I think, a lot of Catholics that, that think along those lines of, oh, finally my soul can escape from my body and, and can find, you know, spiritual salvation. But that's not biblical, is it? I mean, we, we look forward to the resurrection of the dead. We look for the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. The body matters. Again, go back to Irenaeus. Very strong in that against the Gnostics of his time who, who were Platonists, right? The Gnostics felt that escaping from matter, that was what it's all about. And Irenaeus keeps saying, body, body, body. And so the assumption of Mary, body and soul, means that salvation is a matter of the whole person. It's not just a matter of the soul. It's a matter of, of body and soul. So Mary, as it were, is like the first saved, the one who's the first definitively saved follower of Jesus. And her body finds its place in communion with the Lord. Who, by the way, retains his body, so the bodiliness of Jesus matters as well. Think now of the bodiliness of the sacraments. I mean, why wouldn't you just sit around and say, oh yeah, Jesus has saved me, oh that's true, I accept that in my mind, in my heart, and that's it. Wouldn't that be sufficient? And the Catholic Church from, from the Bible on has said, no, because salvation addresses every aspect of you. So Mary, kind of the first of those definitively saved, of course we're talking about both body and soul being brought into a higher dimensional system that we call heaven. Again, don't think of heaven as just a spatial uh, uh, dimension, you know, like it's where the planet Jupiter is. Uh, heaven's a different kind of way of being, different dimensional system. And Mary, body and soul, has been brought into that dimension. That's what the doctrine means, I think. Well, that sound means it's time for our question from one of our listeners. If you have a question, just go to askbishopbaron.com, record your question on any device, and we'd love to hear it and might choose it here for one of our future episodes. Today, we have a question from Resi, who's asking uh, something interesting about humans and angels and why God created us the way he did. So here's Resi's question. Hmm. Okay. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Resi, and I'm from San Diego, California. I was wondering if it's possible for you to answer, why did God create us as humans and not angels? Why couldn't he create me so I could worship him perfectly as an angel? Thank you. It's a cool question, actually. Um, you know what it touches on? This very great mystery of the variety within God's creation. So Thomas Aquinas says that God made such a variegated world. Think of all the different levels of being. From the angels all the way down to rocks, Thomas would have said, but we know, like down to quarks and subatomic particles and all this business. I mean, why is there such wild diversity, How, all these levels of being within creation? His answer is because God wanted to display the fullness of his glory, and no one creature could ever exhaust that glory. No hundred creatures, no million creatures. That He had to gesture, as it were, toward the fullness of his perfection with this artistic panoply of creation. You know, it's a cool answer. It's a very helpful answer. And the medievals, and, and you're getting at this, were very sensitive to the what I call the hierarchy of being, these different levels of being. 
um, does an angel give glory to God in a very distinctive way? And the answer is yes. A higher way. Uh-huh. Yep. And so in a way, in a way, sure, I wish God had made me an angel. I'd love to be an angel. <laughs> You'd be a, a being at a higher pitch of existence. Does the human being give glory to God in a unique and distinctive way that an angel can't? And the answer is yes. The medieval said, for example, that we're a kind of hybrid of the spiritual and the material, which makes us a sort of microcosm. It's as though all of the visible and invisible is summed up in us in a way that it's not summed up in an angel. Now, go down. Let's say a dog could think through this question. Might the dog say, gosh, if only I were human, I'd love to be human. Yeah, I get that. I think if I were a dog, <laughs> I could I could ruminate. I'd probably say, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be at this higher level. So, I mean, all of us are going to be at some point in the hierarchy of being. But all of us, in a unique way, give glory to God. So the idea is, accept the, your place in the hierarchy of being, and then fulfill the mission you've been given, right? Now, to your, your next, next part of the question. Why couldn't I be an angel and just, I'd worship God perfectly? Well, the short answer is, you wouldn't necessarily, right? Because we speak of the fallen angels. Even the angels, some of them, fell. They, they didn't worship God, they worshiped themselves. And so it's not automatic that if I were an angel, everything would be would be hunky dory. I mean, I, I might I might be a fallen angel, as I can be a fallen human being, you know? So again, the idea is determine where you are in the hierarchy of being, determine your purpose as a creature, and then live as dramatically as you can in line with that uh, nature. Again, that's a really good searching question and it's a quick answer. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening and or watching this episode of the Word on Fire show. Again, if you're just listening to the podcast, we've recently started uh, publishing the video versions of these episodes on YouTube. So just go on there, look at Bishop Aaron's YouTube channel, and you'll find many of these episodes showing up now. Also, just one more reminder, if you could please help us out as we move into the new year, visit wordonfireshow.com slash giving and help us accomplish our mission of evangelizing the culture. We depend on your help. Well, thanks again for listening. We'll see you next week on the Word on Fire show.